Hello and welcome to my booktube channel, Jack in the Bookstack, where I talk about a wide variety of book genres and the bookish lifestyle. In 2024, I have had an increased interest in general fiction books, so like contemporary fiction or literary fiction, and I am scouring booktube for recommendations. Another thing that I'm doing to find some fiction books to read is looking at some of these literary awards that are very popular. I recently did a video, which I will link for you, where I read some winners of the Women's Prize for Fiction, and that was incredibly, incredibly successful. I did find some, some great books through that, and I've already read some of the books on the list too that I love. So that one is a good literary prize for my taste. So now I want to try the Booker Prize, which is one that is very popular. I see a lot of reviews on Booker nominees and winners here on Booktube, so I've been wanting to try this. Additionally, I'm getting ready for St. Patrick's Day, so I thought it would be a lot of fun to focus on some Irish books. And I have read Hearts Invisible Furies, which is right there on my bookshelf, which is written by an Irish author and set in Ireland. I loved it. So I thought this would be a lot of fun. And also the International Booker Prize is going to be releasing their long list. So I thought I could talk about that and the prize in general. I was super excited about this. To add to that, I watched a video by Jack Edwards, who is like a huge booktuber. He has over a million followers. So I'm pretty sure you've heard of him. He was kind of working for the Booker Prize because he was hosting their 2023 award show, like interviewing the authors and everything. And about three months ago, he posted a video reviewing all of the books on the shortlist, I believe, that were nominated for this award. And the passion in which he spoke about two of the books really, really called to me. I love the way he described these. And I watched this video knowing he probably can't bash any of the books because he's working for the Booker Prize. So it, I knew it would be a little bit biased, but he really convinced me. I'm gonna link his video down below because I am going to be referencing some of the things that he said. For this reading vlog, I'm gonna take you along with me as I read these books for my everyday bookish life while reading the synopsis from the inside cover telling you what these books are about. Then I'll come tell you my reaction and my thoughts to these books. Let's go ahead and get started with the first one. On a dark, wet evening in Dublin, scientist and mother of four, Eilish Stack answers her front door to find the GNSB on her step. Two officers from Ireland's newly formed secret police are here to interrogate her husband, a trade unionist. Ireland is falling apart, caught in the grip of a government turning toward tyranny. As the life she knows and the ones she loves disappear before her eyes, Eilish must contend with the dystopian logic of this new, unraveling Ireland. How far will she go to save her family? And what, or who, is she willing to leave behind? Exhilarating, terrifying, and surprisingly intimate, Prophet Song is a work of breathtaking originality, offering a devastating vision of societal collapse and a deeply human portrait of a mother's fight to hold her family together. As soon as I started reading Prophet Song, I was amazed. I have never seen this before in my life. So in my reading experience, I have seen some books that don't have quotation marks. Usually there's dashes or something, but this book, not only does it not have quotation marks, but it doesn't even have paragraphs. It is super dense font and all the dialogue is in the same paragraph. So you cannot tell who is speaking or if it's just inner thoughts of our characters. It is so disorienting to read about and makes it really hard to connect to any of the characters. Let's talk about my review of Prophet Song by Paul Lynch. First of all, what really made me want to pick up this 2023 winner of the Booker Prize was some of the things that Jack Edwards was saying. Jack said this was a book about resilience, resistance, survival. He said this is very much a book of our times. He said that this was really about the people making the choice to leave, how difficult it can be, how even if you want to, even if you decide to leave, it might not always be possible. 
The synopsis that I just read you promised this book to be original and about a woman and how far she would go to save her family. And I was really excited to read about the resourcefulness of this woman in this really dire situation, which is dystopian and yet completely believable. Those are some of the things that made me want to pick up this book. But I have to tell you, I was bamboozled. I hated it. I hated it so much. I rate this one star. And you know, when I rate and review books, I try to think, hey, maybe I'm not the target audience. There's got to be something here that some readers will enjoy. And I always try to challenge myself and think of who would enjoy this book. I cannot think of one redeeming quality. I cannot think of one good thing about this book. In my wildest imagination, any, po any positive thing I could say about Prophet Song would be a flat out lie. I feel completely lied to because this was not about a woman holding her family together or making difficult choices to help them survive. She was just denying the situation. She was delusional. She wasn't trying to survive. She was just so entitled. She just kept thinking, well, all this stuff has to end soon because they don't have a right. They don't have a right to do this. And it's all gonna end tomorrow, I just know it. She was just denying the reality of the situation, which I thought was incredibly weak. I could not stand her. She was insufferable. The things that she was saying and thinking and feeling, given the reality of the situation. Outside of that insufferable main character, who I was actually hoping would get unalive because I couldn't stand her that much, there was nothing original about this book. I have seen this plot about a dozen times in different books where the government slowly takes over, citizens lose their rights, they start to turn on each other, war ensues, there's like a rebel force. This always, they, I'm not gonna say it always happens, okay, that's an over-exaggeration. It's just been done so many times and I think it's very relevant and it is kind of scary how it just increases in relevancy as time goes on. Like that fear never goes away about the government taking away rights. So, I mean, cool in that regard, but it's really the writing style too that I can't stand about this book. This whole book is very pretentious and arrogant and inaccessible. And I think with a theme as important as this one, especially given what's going on in the world today, accessibility is key. You want to connect with the readers. You want them to feel sympathy. You want them to feel the struggle of this mother trying to decide to stay or leave. And it didn't evoke any of those emotions. And part of it was really in the writing style. So this is written, and I mentioned it, it's a very dense writing structure where it is just one paragraph. The whole book is like one paragraph. There's some page breaks there's one. There's like some page breaks where you get a little bit of reprieve, but everything is like one block. And there are no quotation marks. I think that this artistic decision was absolutely insane. So the author is trying to give us this like stream of consciousness, a state of confusion and lack of control, maybe, but you can't tell what's going on. How are you supposed to feel those things when you can't tell if it's dialogue, who's talking, if it's an inner monologue, or if it's a dream sequence, because there are some of those. So you're so disconnected from this because you're trying to just figure out what the heck is going on. And it made it even harder for me to connect with our main character, even though I knew that wasn't going to happen because she was such a moron, so delusional and entitled. And it was just, it was impossible to connect to with that writing style. Something else that's interesting, I always perk up when the title makes its appearance in the text. And so that happened to me and I was thinking, oh, this might be a cool quote. And so I wanted to go back and reread it and possibly highlight it or something. I had to go back really far. So on page 303, I know you can't exactly read it, but you can just tell my finger on the page. The sentence starts right here, okay? So the bottom of this page, the sentence continues on this whole page and over here and ends right there. One sentence is a page and a half long. I don't know what the reader is supposed to get out of this artistic choice. It doesn't make any sense, but it, like I said, pretentious, arrogant, inaccessible. 
Jack Edwards absolutely failed me on his review of this book. There's not one redeeming quality. And again, like I said at the beginning, I know he has to hype these books up. That's his job. And this was ultimately the winner. So some experts somewhere claim that this is good literature. I don't, I don't understand it. It kind of makes me think when I was in high school, I was in a photography class and not like digital photography. I mean, like the film, you had to go in the dark room and actually develop yourself. And cameras were, are, super, super manual, right? You have to do all the settings. There wasn't so much like the auto. You have to set the aperture, the shutter speed, all that. And I remember trying to convince my teacher, hey, my image is really blurry because I'm trying to convey confusion and it's underexposed because it's the darkness within. <laughs> I was like trying to pitch this when really I just didn't know what the hell I was doing. I had the wrong settings. And that's kind of what this book makes me think of. Like someone was just playing a joke, but I can't believe the panel of judges said that this was good. And I saw a video and it's by a new to me booktube channel called The Disco King. His review really, really captured how I feel about this book. He had so many great points. He was really entertaining to watch too. But two of the things that he mentioned, he talked about the writing style in terms of how many metaphors are used. And he read them out back to back and it makes it sound so comical. Like does Paul Lynch not know any other way to write than just overuse of these metaphors? And he's like, and the Disco King, he's like, and you may not think it's all that bad, but those are all from the same page. <laughs> There's just so many. And but my favorite part of his review of this book is that he read one metaphor and he pointed out, he's like, I don't think Paul Lynch had anybody edit his book. I don't even think he read the second draft. Like, I don't think he read it again because he used the same metaphor later in the book. He used the same metaphor twice. And it just reads like a mistake. Like he didn't edit his book. And it just, it really highlights the arrogance of this. Why? Why? And there's not even anything original with this plot. So many other authors have done this across all genres. I don't get it, guys. I really don't get how this could win the Booker Prize. So that's a rant. That's a rant of Prophet Song. Let's go ahead and move on to The Bee Sting by another Paul, Paul Murray. The Barnes family is in trouble. Dickie's once lucrative car business is going under, but Dickie is spending his days in the woods, building an apocalypse-proof bunker with a renegade handyman. His wife, Imelda, is selling off her jewelry on eBay and half-heartedly dodging the attention of fast-talking cattle farmer Big Mike, while their teenage daughter, Cass, formerly at the top of her class, seems determined to binge drink her way through final exams. As for 12-year-old PJ, he's on the brink of running away. If you wanted to change this story, how far back would you have to go? to the infamous bee sting that ruined Imelda's wedding day, to the car crash one year before Cass was born, all the way back to Dickie at 10 years old, standing in the summer garden with his father, learning how to be a real man. The Bee Sting, Paul Murray's exuberantly entertaining new novel, is a tour de force, a portrait of post-crash Ireland, a tragic comic family saga, and a dazzling story about the struggle to be good at the end of the world. Paul Murray made a very interesting stylistic choice in The Bee Sting. I don't know if I appreciate it. So in this section, The Widow Bride, we are in the perspective of the mother. But what's interesting is only in her section, so far at least, there's no punctuation. Okay, maybe that's not fair. There's an exclamation point right there, but there's no periods in between sentences. At least the next sentence is capitalized, but largely you can't tell when a new sentence begins and there's no quotation marks in the dialogue. This is very, very confusing, disorienting. I'm not sure what value this is supposed to add and what the reader is supposed to gain from this. I'm just really frustrated and really confused. 
there were a few reasons why I wanted to read The Bee Sting. From that synopsis, which I just read to you, this really made me think of the butterfly effect, which I love. I love investigating the concepts of fate or like an alternate reality where if you made one decision differently, how would the future have changed? And the synopsis really promised that promises that to us. It says, if you wanted to change the story, how far back would you have to go? And it cites these like seemingly simple events that could have changed the course of everything. So the synopsis made me think we were going that direction. And Jack Edwards made me think that's the direction we were going because he actually said the butterfly effect. And you know, if one of these things was different, how would the future have changed for this Barnes family? So that's really what intrigued me to pick this book up. The other Jack also says that this is a masterclass of storytelling and the way he described the writing really intrigued me too. And it's true what he said. So we start out the book with these really long chapters. You definitely feel the length of this book. And each character in this family has their own point of view very dense sections, but as you progress in the book, the chapters get shorter and shorter, and then the chapters have all of the perspectives. And then towards the end, each line is a different character, and it does give the impression of spiraling out of control as things move faster and faster. So the first POV is of Cass. She is the teenager. And so that's how we're introduced to this family in this story. They live in Ireland. The dad owns a VW car dealership and it's the financial crisis. So they're, they're struggling financially. They're used to the nicer things, but they're really, things are changing for them. So Cass in her teenage angsty way has her own issues that are super monumental to her and her family losing their wealth is very hard on her little social life. So we follow her and um, then we cut to her brother PJ who was my favorite character because he's so sweet and innocent and tries to take on so much responsibility for his young age and my biggest frustration with him was just like tell somebody get some help buddy you shouldn't have to deal with this all on your own. Uh, but he was so cute and didn't get a lot of attention from anyone in his family. His sister was too cool for him, shut him out most of the time, and his parents were distracted with other things. So I felt kind of bad for him. Then we cut to the mom's perspective, Imelda, and I hated her perspective because Paul Murray made a choice <laughs> to not only, in this entire book, he doesn't use quotation marks, but at least unlike Prophet Song, he does do like paragraphs and, and line breaks. So he does, there's no quotation marks for dialogue. But in Imelda's point of view, there's no punctuation. Like there's no periods in between sentences. And Jack Edwards does call this out. He says it's supposed to show you that she's losing control of her life, that her life lacks structure. And I'm like, oh, you gotta be kidding me. That doesn't, that, that's not what happens. Again, with my photography example. It's weird. It disconnected me from her point of view. I didn't know what was going on. At least the next sentence like started, it was capitalized. So we, that's a new sentence, I guess. But it was so distracting. So I had a hard time with her story and it didn't focus so much as present day, but it did flash back to like how she got to this situation. But it didn't really give me that butterfly thing. It was just kind of, it was just a flashback telling her story, right? And then the last POV, we focus on the father and who is losing his car dealership, which was a family business, his family dynamics, how he met Imelda and a lot of his backstory and struggles that he's been in. And so those were the four sections and then it gets much faster from there as they alternate a lot quicker. If you could not guess it by how I was talking about it, I would not say this is about the butterfly effect, that this talks about fate at all. Unless you just want to go through and question every little thing on your own, Paul Moran does not guide you through this discussion. He does not investigate different outcomes of decisions. He doesn't focus on any real thing. It's just people's lives story. And I was left thinking, what was the point of any of this? There was no point. It was so unresolved, unsatisfying. I was waiting for it to pick up. I thought, hey, maybe we're dissecting all these things in so much detail because when we get to that butterfly effect discussion, when we get to that alternate realities or alternate outcomes, it'll be all the more powerful because I understand the intricacies of how we got to this situation. 
and I was let down. I was never given that information. Adding on to the fact what I was talking about with the writing style, how there were no quotation marks, which could be confusing in understanding who was talking or if it was even dialogue, but really with Imelda's point of view with no punctuation, again reads very arrogant to me and very chaotic. And it's funny because the book actually calls that out in one section. It calls out what happens when people make up their own grammar rules, which I thought was kind of meta and kind of an interesting point for this book to make. Jack Edwards highlighted in his review video that this book talks about climate change, which I thought would be great, such a relevant topic for today, something I'm interested in. But the bee sting really beats you over the head with climate change without really saying anything, without really making any points. So eventually I just started skimming those sections because it just was so pointless. But everything about this book was pointless. And Jack Edwards says that this is one of his favorite books. Like I think he said this was one of his favorite of the year. I can't remember if he said in that video he thinks this is one of his favorites of all time. This was definitely his favorite pick out of the Booker shortlist. And then Prophet Song was his second favorite. And I, I think you can love whatever you want, right? We all have different tastes, no big deal. But I have really lost all respect, not respect, credibility. Jack Edwards has lost all credibility for me, just like the Booker Prize has lost all credibility for me. And you know what's funny with these two books? The International Booker Prize just came out with their long list announcement today. And I was planning on filming a reaction to that and adding that in this video because I thought that'd be really fun to add, right? My reaction to these books, looking at the summaries, deciding if I want to add them to my TBR. But the Booker Prize has lost all credibility for me. I can't, not only can I not use it as a recommendation, and I don't want to be judgmental, but I think if anybody said they love these books, I would look at them differently because I'm sorry, I hated them. I hated them. And you know what's worse? I can only truly say I have hated two other books in, in my life. There are two books that I would say are the worst books I've ever read. So I've now doubled my list of hated books. And that's because of everything else, I can list some redeeming quality, something that some reader would like. I can acknowledge that. Maybe it's just not for me. And, and most of the times I try to find those elements, but I can't find a single good thing about these books. And to, to show you, like there's only two other ones. And in case you're curious, because I know you might be, um, the books are My Year of Rest and Relaxation by Otessa Most... I'm not sure how to pronounce her name, but I'll, I'll, here, I'll put the, vid the cover here. That's the other one that I hate, and I might trigger some people here. <laughs> but House of Sky and Breath by Sarah J. Mass is the other book that I hate and has no redeeming qualities. I think it's one of the worst things ever written. <sighs> yeah, I know that's triggering. I know that's triggering. Hey, and I like Sarah J. Mass. Okay, book one, Crescent City, House of Earth and Blood is one of my favorite books of all time. So we have like a favorite and then most hated book, but this isn't a rant video on that. I don't even like to make rant videos. I hardly watch rant videos because I don't like the negativity. I actually almost canceled this vlog because I like to hear what people are passionate about. I want to hear books that you love, what you liked about them, or like a really objective review, things that didn't work for you. Those are the things that I like to watch. And I think rant videos are too negative for what I like in my content as a consumer. But um, obviously, I kept this video. And I ranted about these books anyways. Um, no redeeming qualities. I guess if you have read these and you liked them, or if you feel any kind of way but you can identify a redeeming quality, I'd be interested in the comments down below. And I promise you I won't judge you. I really won't. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try. <laughs> I say that like I, I, people can love what they want to love. It's not a big deal. Uh, but I'm like, I don't know if anybody loves this, so I can trust the recommendations. Like Jack Edwards, I'll still watch him, but um, I'm not going to be buying his books anymore. I bought these full price. These books, this video cost me $60 because I bought these full price and I'm mad. Oh, I'm so mad. I'm going to take those and resell them as soon as I can. <sighs> Thank you for watching. Thank you for putting up with me in this negative state. I'm so sorry I don't have any positivity to bring to your day. 
but maybe you can take pleasure in my suffering? I don't know. That could be a silver lining. Until the next video, happy reading! Thank you.